Hello everyone, my name is Gitika Gorthy, and today I am very, very honored to be interviewing a very special space champion, Mr. Antonio. Mr. Antonio is an international business developer and space policy analyst who is also a future TARCS Arctic Expedition member, UHG Foundation Himalayas Expedition member, TMG 24 under 24 leaders and innovators in STEAM and space, and a Korea NJ award winner. Currently, Mr. Antonio is an Asia Pacific Regional Partnerships Manager for the Space Generation Advisory Council and is a volunteer and member in many organizations like the Conrad Challenge and SETS. His inspirational work and recognitions are truly inspiring and remarkable. And I can't wait to learn more about Mr. Antonio's story and journey into the space industry. Welcome, Mr. Antonio. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your busy schedule to conduct this interview. Here, thanks, Gitika, for this call. Um, I'm very, I've always been excited to be involved in the space sector when I was, since I was very, very young. My life did take go, quite a few turns in the way where I started from wanting to be an aerospace engineer, but I got involved in the field of space policy. I fell in love with it. It's not a field that a lot of people know exists even, but it is a very, space policy and law is a very, uh, is a, is a big field in its own. We don't have too many people working on it, but at the same time, a lot of things that are happening in space right now won't be possible without us. I'm very happy uh, to talk about this with other students and young professionals out there in case you wanna be more involved in space or especially the space policy sector. Yeah, a part of this interview series is really to highlight the diverse careers. I mean, as a high school student, a lot of my friends I know are into law, but they never like think about or know space policy. And so whenever I bring it up, they're like, wait, is that like a real, real career? Can I do that? So I'm definitely interested in how you discovered space policy and how you got into it. Um, but first, you know, I'm really curious to know about, you know, the current organizations you're a part of. Like I was mentioning earlier, you're a part of SGA, you know, you're part of the Conrad Challenge, which is like an innovation uh, type program, as well as like SEDS. So what is some, what are some interesting like projects that you've worked on and, you know, how did you get involved in so many activities? Right. So the largest organization, I mean, the organization that takes up the most time is the Space Generation Advisory Council or SGAC. So that is, so this organization was created from the United Nations back uh, about 30 years ago um, to advocate and represent the young voices to the United Nations, specifically to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Issues of Outer Space. Uh, we call it UN Popius because that is a very long name. Uh, but it's basically the one UN body where, uh, where all the UN member countries come together and talk about how to be more involved in space and to coordinate activities in space. Um, I mean, you can think of space as an area where we could just like fire up rockets and have satellites. Um, and do orbits, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that. You do need, um, like if you have an orbit that you want to have your satellites in, but it's already occupied by other countries, uh, what to do when you have a geosynchronous satellite or for a territory that is not yours, et cetera. So that's where a lot of these things come from. Um, and the foundational treaty that was, uh, that was conceived for this is called the International Space Treaty. And that was founded from the UN Copios. But in doing all this, we haven't had too much progress in terms of international treaties for the last few decades. And the UN, uh, one of the UN's mission is to ensure that we have sustainable space exploration and utilization for the way forward. Uh, and that meant that having a lot of youth voices heard in the UN committee chamber, that was why the SGAC was founded. And SGAC is one of the oldest and one of the largest space space organizations for young members have been taking great care of that. I'm, as you already mentioned, I'm the Asia Pacific Regional Partnerships Manager, which means that I work with a lot of organizations, companies uh, that involve research institutions, government organizations, space agencies in the Asia Pacific region. And that covers a very wide swath of territory and countries. So I talk with a lot of those countries and a lot of the members out there. I sometimes host events. Um, that is moderated by SGAC, organized by SGACs, or just partnered by SGAC um, in thinking what are the things or what are the topics that we can really hear the future generation story on and then delivering them to the United Nations. Um, and that's uh, basically what I do in SGAC. I also have a lot of other organizations that I work on for space. 
but in, if I'm going to talk about SGC, that would be it. Yeah, that's amazing. I think, you know, I've heard so much about Space Generation Advisory Council, and it has such a yes. large impact on like students and being able to, you know, actually inform other, you know, students who are currently in high school or college about the different opportunities that are there. So I'm really glad for such a student led program that exists. It's, you know, it's really nice. Yeah. I mean, again, at the same time, so you also mentioned SETS, which is the uh, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. So that is exclusively for students, so you need to be part of an academic program to do that. At the same time, SGAC is for young professionals under the age of 35. So actually, most of our members, uh, I mean, a good number of our members do come from academia as students. So at the same time, a lot of our members are also young professionals who are starting in industry, like who are either working for the big aerospace companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Airbus, um, the United Launch Alliance, SpaceX, et cetera, while at the same time um, doing a lot of their own startups because uh, startups within a, lot, within a lot of different regions and countries. So we do have a very diverse group of people that we're working on from. Yeah, that's really nice to hear. And so, you know, you're involved in all these programs and have been able to work with different companies. So I'm sure you've been a part of some cool projects or research, maybe even in your education. So what is like your most exciting project or research you've been a part of? Wow, that's a very hard question because I have had a lot of, I mean, I've had the great opportunity to have been working in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, I can first tell you about the school that I've, been to, I actually graduated just last year. It's called Minerva Schools, and that's a school that for four years of undergraduate uh, of undergraduate study, you have to travel to seven different countries around the world wow. and immerse yourself in different culture and so cool. um, and different academic programs. I mean, not academic programs. We have our own unique academic program that is unique uh, that is fit for the future, where we do not have any exams. Uh, all of our classes are debate oriented. We do uh, field projects. And we turn in assignments that are graded. So that was an opportunity where I took um, to ensure that I can have a more future oriented education for myself. And during those four years, I was fortunate enough to get a lot of different opportunities, including uh, going to the Arctic as part of a hundred people crew uh, from all around the world. So it was like the Future yeah. Talks Foundation uh, gathered all a hundred world leaders around the world took them on a ship, uh, sent them to the Arctic to kind of find out what would be the next big problems in the world and how do we solve them. And um, they also wanted young voices. They did not feel like if they, if they have a bunch of old people, uh, adults in the ship talk about world problems, then we're not going to capture a great uh, segment of the world population. So I was part of the younger student um, leaders were selected to go uh, be a part of that. So that was one project that was very exciting. I also got to go to the Himalayas. Um, I also went to, uh, to Peru for like uh, to, install, to install water filtration systems for the Peru population um, and a lot of other interesting projects. I have a lot to talk about, but I feel like that my most fortunate opportunity of all my life is having that opportunity to travel around the world, to visit so many different countries, to meet with so many people that really opened up my perspective. Um, at the same time, knowing the potential of space in bringing people together for a unified goal and vision, because my passion for going to the space sector is to ensure that people live harmoniously and as one humanity and kind of like go over the smaller differences we have and aiming for a larger goal and achieving things that only we as humanity when we have a unified frontier can achieve so yeah, yeah that those are amazing and it actually brings up really like two questions i'm really curious about first you were mentioning how your school didn't have tests but rather it was more like project-based learning from what i understood which i think is amazing i feel like a lot of schools right now are trying to incorporate more project-based learning so from your experiences you know did you feel like this type of learning was more beneficial to you compared to other education systems you may have been a part of? Do you think that this type of project-based learning uh, helped you kind of gain more knowledge than you would have just taking exams at a you know regular college or university? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when I was in high school, I applied and I got accepted to a lot of universities. Um, this was uh, my high school time was an era where I 
only wanted to do aerospace engineer. I loved rockets and planes and anything that flew, uh, anything that had wings or engines, I was in. And I wanted to build those. And I thought being an engineer and making hard, I mean, hardware changes to people's lives was the way forward and benefiting people. And I did a lot of fascinating things in high school, including building a space toilet, like a microgravity toilet. That's how I uh, came part of the Conrad Challenge and the Conrad Foundation, where I'm also working as an alumni leadership council member right now. Um, and then after all that, and then I applied to a lot of schools and got admissions from quite a few universities around the world uh, for aerospace and mechanical engineering, including like Cambridge University, Imperial College, uh, University College London, UC Berkeley, Purdue, uh, Michigan, a lot of the universities with great aerospace engineering programs. At the same time, uh, I also heard of this Minerva Schools as an exceptional, very unique university that still had no alumni. Um, I'm the second graduating class, so we did not have, we only had one class to look forward to. And there was, there was very little known about the university or its curriculum, but I got a recommendation from a friend that this is an opportunity for me to do, to do some groundbreaking work. I wasn't even sure if the university was gonna exist for four years for me to be able to graduate. It did. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but those four years are four years that I would never take back. In those four years, I've been able to go into so many organizations, work in so many different things. I've been part of venture capitals, uh, part of startup accelerators, start of multi, uh, multinational companies. Um, I was a consultant and lecturer for so many different places because of all the opportunities that I've had. Um, living in seven different countries and getting that perspective if I was, I believe that if I was in a normal university doing a normal curriculum, then after I'm graduating, then I would have so much trouble trying to find work, trying to get real tangible uh, work experience. But in my four years at the university, I had more work experience than a lot of managers out there with five years or 10 years of work experience because I've had that breath that just this is very difficult to parallel in the 21st century world. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's definitely making me intrigued because I personally have never heard of such a, you know, university that, you know, is more like really focused on project-based learning. I think in the future that that's the, that's what's going to happen. I think application learning is much more beneficial than just learning the material and trying to reg regurgitate all of that on a test. So I definitely agree with what you were saying. And I'm actually really curious. I was reading about your Conrad challenge project and was immediately intrigued. Could you tell us more about like space toilet and like your invention and what was like, you know, your motivation, inspiration behind it? Cause I think it's really creative. So, you know, I want to learn more about it. Yeah, I mean, this might be, uh, I mean, if you're listening to this, then you might be one of these kids, but I was that kid that was all about inventing and drawing. I had a bunch of blueprints back in my, I mean, in my computer because it's a 21st century. Who do you <laughs> I, mean, I do all my things on my tablet. So I have a bunch of blueprints for very crazy things. I had an invention that would capture atmospheric electricity, basically lightning and turn them into... Uh, and then like kept that into energy. I had a bunch of mechanical ma uh, batteries, which are not chemical batteries, but like uh, batteries to store energy in motion, et cetera. So I had a lot of different inventions. Um, and then Conrad Challenge, or back when it was called the Conrad Innovation of Spirit Challenge, was one of the more premier challenges in terms of aerospace. Again, I'm one of those kids that just, like goes to science fairs and do all the, you know, the Google science affair, the Intel science fair, all those things. And, but Conrad was a very unique opportunity in that it wasn't just about engineering, but all it was also about application and making a business impact out of it. So I really like that side because in my, all my three years of, I mean, high school study, I've not only done engineering, but I've also done so much project management. And that's how I kind of got into the business side or business aspect of things as well. I'm doing marketing, of ensuring that whatever product this is, it also communicates and and, um, and is, um, it really solves some need to the customer. And I was trying to figure out if we're gonna have a lot of people living in space, including the International Space Station. I mean, the ISS is great, but it's also old and it's also pretty small. And I'm pretty sure 
that there will be larger orbiting space settlements out there that will be coming along. And one thing that I noticed was the ISS only has two toilets and they, and each toilet has like seven to like more than 10 fans to operate it because it has to suck all the, all the waste somewhere. And it does have to have some redundancy procedures in order to ensure that whenever something's put in, it does get sucked in because if it doesn't, then we have a bit of a problem there. Like we have a, you don't want certain things floating around in space. Yeah. So I realized that one, it's a very complex and complicated mechanism. Um, and the more complex and complicated something is, the more prone it is to failure. And the more prone something is to failure, the more redundancy you have to put in and the more complex that gets. So it's kind of like that cycle, like never ending cycle of like, where do you have to balance? And I just realized, can't there be a simpler way of toilets, like something that is also more, um, more intuitive because right now we have a bunch of astronauts that train years, including how to use the toilet. So we know they're gonna be able to do it, but at the same time, but in the future, we're gonna have a lot of people space who tourism. just go, go up space, up space tourism, are gonna be there for a short time. They want to use a toilet that's a bit more intuitive, easy to use, that won't break. So I came up with an idea where you kind of fire jets inside of a, a 3D printed container fire jets of water, it makes a siphon and then the water, the water pressure itself kind of pushes everything through a hole, which is practically how normal toilets work in, um, in on earth is just out of here. We have the gravity to kind of pull all the water out, but I wanted to ensure that. So I wanted to, so, I mean, that was an idea that I had, like, like if you have a jets oriented in a certain manner in a, in a certain type of container that kind of flows that jets of water in a certain manner, then even in microgravity, you will ensure that this water will go in a one direction. And so I had that idea once and then I developed it by, so how do I do this? How do I experiment with this? And then I came up with um, something called CFD or computational fluid dynamics. And then I got to know a program developed by Autodesk that can simulate it. So I was like, Okay, great idea. Um, and then I wanted to do an experiment and prototype. I don't have microgravity, but the least I can do is to do a computer simulation of it. So I went, I went and did that. I mean, I went and learned how to use the program. I also learned how to do 3D modeling so that I can build a mold for the structure to, for the thing to go in, experimented a few structures, um, did a lot of simulations and then found the structure and the type of water jets I wanted to put in to ensure that whatever is put in there sucks the way out even microgravity. So that's basically what a microgravity program is. Wow, that, that is amazing. That was beautifully explained. I mean, you know, first off, I think it's amazing that you think like an engineer, not only are you thinking of a real world problem, but you're finding ways to like solve it and actually do it. And so now I'm actually really curious, why didn't you pursue uh, the engineer aspect of the space industry, because obviously I could see your passion coming out when you were talking about, you know, actually doing and constructing and building. So what made you choose space policy and how did you kind of divert? Yeah, so uh, the easy answer is that I went to Minerva. Uh, Minerva Schools does not have an engineering program. It's a liberal arts college. So okay. it did not have a engineering program, which meant that I had to find a way to continue my space education and advocacy. Uh, what it does have is that it has a splendid liberal arts uh, a college program and it doesn't explicitly have a major concentration for policy. It does have like some policy science related concentrations. Um, I ended up I ended up graduating with a degree in computer science and business by the way but going to a liberal arts college and traveling to all the different countries gave me a lot of perspective. So previously, my worldview was very US centric and Western centric. I mean, it's all about NASA. It's all about, it's all about like having a government program fund the space exploration program and all the efforts of space engineering kind of go hand in hand to it. But then in all of my training, I realized that NASA is not the only world out there. There are other space needs. NASA has a, a huge budget. Uh, sometimes NASA's budget parallel those of like 
the budget of, of small countries. And that is a ginormous budget. They can conduct so many experiments, uh, send up so many satellites or atmosphere-based uh, things that a lot of countries can't afford to do. And But at the same time, I realized that it's, a lot of times it's not just about the money. It's about political power and political leverage because for a lot of the hardware that you want to acquire in order to do something or just acquire certain technologies, you have political barriers, even for non-US citizens to be working in the space sector. Most people won't be able to do it because of this restriction called ITAR. And the US very strictly regulates what technologies are exported to other countries or what nationals can come into the US to learn certain technologies, which means that apart from existing spacefaring countries like Russia, the United States, uh, or quite a few more developed European countries or basically member countries that are a member of the European Space Agency or countries like or, uh, like Japan or, or China that, or, and India that has had a lot of budget to allocate to space. So basically, if you don't have political clout or a huge budget, you just weren't able to come into the space industry. And this goes back to into why I got a very affectionate and passionate in space to begin with is that I wanted space to come down to earth and to be able to better the people here on earth. People, I mean, a lot of times when we talk about space budget, people are like, why are we spending so much money in developing rockets and going to space when you have people starving here on earth? We have roads and infrastructures and schools that are underfunded, but that undercuts the benefits of space um, provides to people. Just maintaining and having a GPS constellation system, doing all the experience out there in space that just simply cannot be replicated here on earth and base and you and just forward in the frontiers of science, like all the things like gravitational waves, those are things that can be experimented much cheaper and better in space. And just finding out who we are with the Hubble Space Telescope, with the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, and all the cosmology and astrophysics, those are things that are also innately makes us human. Like, and a lot of countries are barred for having those type of experiments because of either financial or political systems. And I wanted to change that. I wanted to, I want a space to be a more open culture where countries help out each other, where it's not just countries, but also companies that are going out that are grown in one area, but also be able to sell products to recruit personnel and employees from a lot of different cultures and countries. And that's where I went into space policy. So basically, I took a limitation, took a, a given upon myself as a liberal arts college where I did not have engineering and I and I pivoted in a way we were there, okay, as a liberal arts college student, what is an impact that I can make in the space sector? I realized that having, going into this very niche area of space policy, I can open an area, an avenue for, I mean, I can't be an, I, I cannot become an engineer right now, but I can open up ways for so many other people to become engineers in space and not only engineers in space, but business people in space, experiments and scientists and researchers in space by opening up that uh, space policy frontier. So that's how I kind of transitioned into space policy. But again, my biggest role was SGAC and doing all that UN advocacy work where I just find, found out that this was a thing and doing a lot of space policy work through SGAC and a lot of other organizations, including um, Alliance for Space Development, where I got to like go to uh, the US Congress and advocate for a lot of the space laws out there. I mean, advocate for a lot of um, um, house proposals and Senate proposals out there kind of thing. So that was a very long answer to a very short question, but. Yeah, no, 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 I actually really enjoyed that, like, you know, short synopsis of why you got into space policy. I think, you know, I was talking with a few other really nice, cool space champions, and they were saying exactly what you were saying. Like, they want to create a more collaborative, inclusive space environment. I mean, you know, a lot of the space advancements we have in like the star of NASA, I mean, sadly, it was due to political reasons. And it was due to like, you know, trying to be the most powerful nation in the you know the, in the world and so we started because of political reasons but if we can divert this energy into a more of a collaborative way and you know hopefully sending humans to mars will be a collaborative mission between various countries you know 
I think it would be beneficial to bring all of, you know, different countries together, different people together and incorporate the more inclusivity in it. I mean, I think politics is great, but it shouldn't really affect the scientific advancements and how we're all at the end of the day, still humanity is, you know, we, we're all curious about the planet we're living in and the world outside. So I definitely agree with what you were saying about the inclusivity of space and trying to, you know, allow for that growth. Uh, so I, I'm really glad you got into space policy, even though you also are very passionate about the engineering aspect of the space industry. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So my next question for you is, you know, you have had some amazing achievements, amazing work. I mean, how were you able to achieve so much at such a young age? Like, where is your inspiration? Like, what is your motivation? And how did you also, I'm curious, you know, how did you get into the space industry? Like, was there, you know, when you were a little kid, a teacher, a class, um, a book, a movie, something that really inspired you? Yeah. Um, I feel like, I mean, I, I mean, I don't think anyone comes into space just like, wakes up and I want to do space. Yeah. I have a lot of different inspirations. Um, we, uh, so that's a question where I can actually plug in the Artemis generation. So we have had a lot of different generations previously in terms of the space. We had the Apollo generation who saw Apollo missions and then got motivated. We had the space shuttle generation where they saw the space shuttle um, and the ISS becoming built and were inspired by that. And we belong in the Artemis generation where we are in the gap between a lot of huge space programs. We kind of had a Mars mission that in the that in the previous administration got transitioned into the Artemis mission. So we had that super strong Mars traction and then we got diverted the moon, uh, to the moon. And now we are the Artemis generation where we have that passion, that energy directly towards sending people back to the moon, but this time to stay. Um, and not just, and this time, not just white male yeah. people sitting for us, uh, sitting for the moon, but opening it up for more Americans, more inclusive, uh, regardless of gender or sexual, pro or sexual preferences or identities. But as Americans in a more diversified culture, going back to the moon, not as simple Americans, but as like a more vanguard of humanity, of uh, the frontier as one of the countries out there to go to the moon and building sustainable infrastructure on the lunar surface and ensuring that the lunar economies, once it happens, will be used, can be used by all countries um, in a peaceful manner. So that's the generation that we come from. But of course, when I was young, I was influenced more by books and movies, um, I was always intrigued by things that flew. There was this one movie that not a lot of people know. It's a Japanese animated movie from Studio Ghibli, directed by Miyazaki Hayao. Um, and it's about, um, it's about a city called, it's about this city called Laputa, which is a floating city, and the, the namesake is from Gulliver's, Gulliver's Travel, that also has a, a flying city called Laputa. Uh, but it has a sci fi twist to it that says that Laputa is a super high tech um, civilization that exists that managed to um, make things fly. And as that very high technological city, it was a vanguard of humanity. It, promoted peace and sustainable use of technology over all the other countries. And as a floating city, it was a city that did so much diplomacy and kind of united humanity together, but at the same time, human greed. I mean, it was one of those like childhood, uh, children movies there because of human greed and corruption, it started to use those powers and forces for war. And, um, and then luckily it kind of broke down and the city kind of fell apart and became a mystical legend that no one could really find and not a lot of people believed in later on. So that's what I saw. And that's when I kind of found the, uh, found the passion to go into space. So I didn't only want to like go to space or just as a temporary exploration. I wanted to build something like Laputa, a symbolic civilization that was in space that could oversee all the other problems on the world. And we already have a word for it. It's called the overview effect that once you're up in space, you don't see national borders. You don't see the color of someone's skin. You don't see economic disparity. You only see one humanity that is inhabiting this very small planet 
with a very, very thin, razor thin atmosphere that separates us from the death and the void of space. And in this little spaceship called Earth, we're uh, we're traveling together and with the overview effect, we're over that we're able to overcome so many of our differences and come together. And that was kind of perspective that I wanted to provide to the people. I mean, now that I'm phrasing like this, it doesn't it's kind of like very hard to believe that a kid could think of all of this when he was like, and because I was like a kindergarten, barely in elementary school uh, when I thought of this. But again, when I was young, it's just like, oh my God, having something that is floating up there and people must all unite and bring peace. It's kind of like the more childish um, passion I had. I just managed to like have that passion for a very long time through now, like for like two decades. But that was basically it where I'm like, okay, we must promote a more sustainable and peaceful use of our earthly resources and of our human power, uh, human ingenuity and passion. And the way to do it is to create a civilization up in space as a symbol, like not everyone can go to space, but at the same time, that's not the point. Just having, just being able to look up to the night sky, see the moon and know that there's something that we as humanity has unifiedly created would be a symbol enough so that we can come over differences and, and work together for a better goal. I mean, even for the Apollo mission, when the first people set foot on the moon, we everyone was rejoicing mm -hmm. about there are people who are out there on that little celestial body and that represents an achievement for all of us, not just for Americans. And I wanted to recreate that passion and worldview by having space city. So if you asked me what I wanted to become uh, when I was like in elementary and middle school, I would have answered a space city architect because that is what I want to do for like as long as I can remember. That is that is so unique and it's so amazing the way you worded that. I mean, now, of course, it's refined from how you thought of it as a child, but to see that development and growth is just amazing. I mean, when you were saying how what's like a thin atmosphere is like separating us from, you know, this this space shuttle we're living in, which is like Earth and like, you know, death. I mean, if you think of it, we're all in this one unified place together. And if you think about, you know, we fight or not fight, but we have these differences because of borders we created and like different you know divides and you know of how we look but if you think in the broad aspect and like when you're an astronaut up in space we're, we look unified we are unified we're like together we're one uh and we're like going everywhere together and you know regardless of whatever differences we may have because of our circumstances that we've created it, it doesn't matter because we're all one and you know, the way you worded it was just it, amazing. I think every single person should actually view what you just said because it is completely inspirational. And I think it changes the way you think about the, I don't want to say petty, but it's really petty arguments we're having. And, you know, the way we're trying to divide space into being like, oh, you know, this is like a European achievement. This is like American achievement. It's not, it's a human achievement. We all are advancing together, developing on technologies on top of each other uh, to just learn together. And so I, I think that is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And, Thank you. Yeah. And so did you always imagine yourself in the position you are in today? Obviously, you changed from like a space architect to a space policy. But did you always imagine yourself to be so deeply immersed in the space industry, you know, have so many great accomplishments? Um, I mean, did you always imagine yourself uh, to that level? Or did you kind of have some twists and turns in your journey? I, I knew that I would always be involved in space. I might have had also like some dips in my life where I was like very heavily depressed and had a lot of hard times because I was taking on so much work. I just couldn't see the end of whatever work I was doing. And in, and any of those times, I would just look up at the night sky and then see the moon and be like, one day I'm going to be up there. One day something I built will be up there on the moon. And that is how I managed to get over it. Uh, that's how I managed to like uh, go over some of my most difficult times in life. And even when I'm beaten and shaken, and I mean, I've achieved so many, I mean, I was able to achieve a lot of different things and grab onto so many opportunities because I've also had so many failures. Uh, if you saw me back in high school, my high school colleagues would can tell you, I mean, I was one of the most awarded students in my high school history 
of just, I had so many awards internationally, nationally, and regionally. At the same time, my friends could tell you that I was literally going to a new competition or conference every week and I would get an award ratio like one out of a hundred. I mean, that's an exact ratio, but it feels like that out of the hundred competitions I go in, I would get a, manage to get an award in one of them. So I went through so many different failures and heartbreaks and feeling like this is not going to work. That, that patent failed, this competition failed, this idea did not win, this paper got rejected. I had so many rejections in my life. And in all those times, it was the vision that one day I'm going to send something up there, possibly myself, to the moon to create that symbol um, of humanity. And I wanted for that legacy, my legacy, to outlive me and have a beacon for all the generations to come. If I can contribute even a little bit in exploring space and making space a more open and sustainable frontier for all of us, then it would be worth it. And that's how I kind of like got over my hardest day. So yes, I always knew that I would be up in space at some point. I knew that this is a passion that I simply could not give up. And it was down to the very core of me. If you strip away all my other layers and position titles, just making contribution to space and to the people and humanity was is something that is so integral to my identity, even from when I was like so young. So yeah, I always knew that I would be in space or be involved in, in the sector, just in different capacities. Um, as you said, I transitioned from engineering. I had a time where I was more involved in space businesses and space companies and also space policy and space law. I hit here and there, but I always exist within the space ecosystem. Yeah, I think, you know, what you were saying about, you know, you going to 100 competitions and, you know, maybe succeeding in a ratio of one, which obviously is a little exaggerated, but that's, you know, how it felt like for you. And I think, you know, that shows your persistence. I think every one of us can learn from you and always try, like, to T seek opportunities and try everything even if you may not win it's always like exposure and opportunity because you know you have the most awards but it took a lot of effort and time for you to get that and you know, not everything was successful but you worked for it and I think that itself shows your character your passion your commitment to space I mean a lot of times you know as a high school student right now I apply for a lot of things as well and you know, not a lot of things work out, but then I consider even one thing out of the 20, 30 things I applied for working out as a success because, you know, it's like one step forward. Of course, it's like heartbreaking. Sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know if, you know, space is for me. I'm getting like so many rejections or, you know, not very successful. But I think having that one success or like commitment and passion um, is always going to help you and push you forward and is always worth it at the end. So yeah. what... Yeah. So was there like throughout these obstacles and throughout your journey, did you ever have like a mentor or a teacher or an internship that really helped, you know, propel your journey forward? Yes and no. I've had quite a few mentors in my time, but more than anything, it was a community that really drove me forward. Um, I did have, I still do have a few mentors that I consistently work with or mentors that were simply inspirational about their ideals and just about their ideals and the work that they were doing. At the same time, it was more about the community of people. So knowing, I mean, until high school, I was the only person that I knew that were involved in space. Like look around me and like no one is doing space. No one is even passionate about space. And they're like, huh, okay, <laughs> stars. Yeah, I got better things to do on the ground. Um, was until my high school, and then I went to university, and then I began interacting with people. And that's also when I really got more concrete with what I wanted to do for my life, or like how I wanted to contribute to humanity as a whole. And not everyone out there is passionate about space, but being part of a community that is passionate about space, and not just about expanding the frontier and all that, but knowing that we're doing this for the betterment of humanity and believing that space can be a tool and a purpose in itself in expanding the human horizons and being part of the community, knowing that I wasn't the only person who's been living with that. Again, if you're a part of a space community, then you might take this for granted, but more likely than not, if you're a space enthusiast, 
most often a lot of people around you don't care about space they don't really know much about space exploration uh we've had a lot i mean as as i said as our generation we had a long gap since the space shuttle um the spacex launch uh the spacex demo 2 launch was the first time in long in it's the first time in a long time where american astronauts took off from american soil to the iss and we had that very large gap in which the public was kind of shielded from all the preparations that we were doing for the next big leap forward um in going and going to the moon and mars and beyond and exploring the universe so a lot of people right now are very disenfranchised from the space environment for all the passion and the vision that we have within the space community so being back in the community that I knew I was a part of. Again, if you grew up reading Asimov and uh, Arthur C. Clarke, then you come from a certain mindset. And during that gap years, you are more grounded or terrestrial based, as I can say. And after I went to the university and started meeting up with more people, I went back in the community that I knew I was a part of just this time in the flesh. So my energizing was not a particular I mean I if you ask me for a mentor then I can like drop names but at the same time when it really got me to the passion and energizing it was the community um right now it's a space generation advisory council community that really drives me forward as well as the Conrad Foundation family and a horde of other families like Yuri Nice family the World Space Week organization family the National Space Society uh, family I have a lot of different space families and societies out there but it's just driving that dream forward, seeing other people incessantly putting themselves at risk um, in, in just like forwarding that dream. That community is what has really driven me forward. It's the little people, um, little connections that I meet in my, in my endeavors, in my trips around the globe and seeing that anywhere I go to, there is someone out there who is dreaming of sending themselves or like, someone into space and looking into the stars and dreaming and that's where it excites me and that's my driving juice forward yeah that that's amazing i feel like what you were mentioning earlier with diversity and inclusivity in space and space careers but you know there's been a huge gap in the space industry i feel like uh news has not been Space news has not been as frequent for the general public as it has been the past few years. There has been a small gap, I feel like. And so trying to, you know, seeing the reignition of a lot of space news and excitement with the general American public, people who are not involved in the space industry themselves, is just so exciting. And I'm, you know, I'm really glad to see people starting to acknowledge space in a much greater level and seeing more enthusiasts in space and the diverse space careers like space policy. And so, you know, learning about your journey has been amazing. Learning about your work and inspirational things has been, you know, truly remarkable. It shows your character and true passion. And I'm sure throughout your journey so far, and you're still quite young, you have a long way to go, um, but you've probably learned a lot of life lessons. And so my last question for you is, what advice do you have for young people regarding their pursuit of a passion in the STEM field or the space industry or really anything they want to pursue, something that you wish you knew when you were maybe in high school or college? Right, I have, uh, everyone, I have just the right answer for that. What I tell them, like my one advice to high school students is to look at the Mars rovers because that is where I believe the very spirit of humanity lies in that we go out there, we we find, we create opportunities that did not exist there before. We open up those opportunities for other people, for fellow uh, fellow humans and fellow, fellow earthlings. And then in the hardest circumstances, when we don't see any hope, we persevere. Um, we persevere within those hardships and we believe that this dream can be achieved and then you, we use human ingenuity to fly upward and, and literally see new horizons of what we can be doing so again i'm literally just naming dropping all the mars rovers the mars rovers aren't named for nothing and yes, definitely and my advice is that if you're feeling down if you're feeling if you're having doubts about yourself go read a book 
from Asima, from Arthur C. Clarke, or from one of the so many other astronauts or foundational members of the space community, their biographies. And you can see a very human element to all this. I feel the current disenfranchisement or the, uh, the ironical, the alienation of the space community is the fact that we have had been able to connect it to the world, uh, to the people and humanizing the space experience, making sure that there's a human element to all this is very important. And reading, like pick up, like go to a bookstore or go to the, your local or school library, pick up a book about space, like what it took um, for all these people, like for John F. Kennedy, for uh, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, they've had families and they had made so much sacrifice in making that small step forward, but a giant leap for humanity, for mankind. And knowing that we are here, like as Newton said, we are here because we're standing on the shoulders of giants, acknowledging the sacrifices that they've made and taking that forward to your energy, knowing that you can also be making that change, change. But at the same time, also reach out to people like myself, the space industry in the 21st century, in the 2020s and the 23rs and 24s is going to be radically different than of those from the Apollo era, from the spatial era. The space era for now isn't about NASA, despite the hoodie that I'm mm -hmm. wearing. It's about SpaceX, about Blue Origin. It's about Firefly or space. It's about, um, it's about all Lockheed, Air, Lockheed Martin and ULA. It's about uh, this the new space era where companies, instead of government entities, are really taking charge in exploration and doing end of in innovation. Reach out to people who are doing those groundbreaking work. And it's especially in the new space era that the space community is becoming more open because contrary to NASA or JAXA or Roscosmos or, or ISRO, these companies have less of a limitation when it comes to innovation and recruiting international partners, international customers, and employing international citizens. Talk to those people, learn what you can do because we are literally opening up a new, new space in space for people to come together and work. Talk to those people. Uh, I am in a job that I did not know existed and probably when I was young didn't actually exist. I just knew that I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. And I basically created the title space policy consultant or space policy expert first before I actually knew it was a thing. So okay. go into the world, read more, talk to more people and find an area that you want to be involved in. And it's better, much better if it's a path that no one took before, because probably if no one took that job before, then you have a, you have a better likelihood of actually pursuing that dream rather than going for a job that existed for like a few decades or a few hundred years. Because like, I mean, I'm just gonna like say 50%, but 50% of the job in the space industry for the next half century would be jobs that don't, that then never existed before. So find out new jobs for yourself, find out new roles, talk to people about not only about what they have done, but what they see as a vision for the next 50 years, because that is where you belong. That is where your careers belong in. And yeah, make things, build things, prototype, fail, um, and have fun, most importantly. Yeah, I think those are some amazing pieces of advice and I can relate to a lot of them like, you know, I put the word space and medicine together and then found out it was a real career. So I can definitely relate with that. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's so many careers out there and the future of space with the opening of commercialization, space tourism, it's, it's all very exciting. And um, I wanna thank you so much, Mr. Antonio, for taking some time to do this. I mean, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and I can't wait to see the amazing things you do in the future. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for the call. Thank you.